we are not trading Ukrainian territories. Not a single inch. If Putin is not stopped in Ukraine, there will be terrible implications for European and global security. An aerial bomb of a maternity hospital is the conclusive evidence that what is happening is a genocide of Ukrainians. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Ukrainian officials say a Russian airstrike has hit a children's hospital in Mariupol. President Zelensky calls on all European nations to strengthen their sanctions. High-profile talks in Turkey, Ukrainian and Russian officials, ministers, foreign ministers, meet to discuss a possible ceasefire, and the ECB holds its first meeting since the start of the war in Ukraine. Officials weigh the impact of the conflict on the economy as well as surging inflation. So let's check in on the markets. Now, we were expecting actually a higher start, especially after the boost that a lot of the equity markets got yesterday. Not so. European stock markets down some 0.9 percent. The focus seems to be from investors about the fear of inflation. It's also very clear that we've seen a disruption overall on the markets. I'm looking at a couple of commodities on my screen, which you can also see here. There was a reversal from the UAE yesterday. First of all, saying OPEC Plus, they thought, should put more barrels of oil on the market. And then then uh, we're tracking or certainly tempering that on Twitter. So we're not sure exactly what the position of the UAE is, whether they're comfortable in being the lone wolf in that pack, uh, trying to say that they need to do more. 113.80 is where we are. But all eyes, of course, on the ECB and what it means, for example, for euro and what we're seeing for euro dollar. Now, if you look at the limited power of the European Central Bank, what it can do, for example, for stemming prices, the the only thing they could do is not only rely on fiscal stimulus, but of course, what they can do is trying to temper the euro's uh, slide. Commodity markets really witnessing some of the wilder swings over this week, and market sentiment perked up yesterday, uh, today, less so as they're trying to figure out what the US CPI number will be, and of course, what it means coming from the ECB. Also, the balance sheet of the banks. This is something that we can't forget because, of course, they're in charge of that. The DAX, 1.5% lower, similar losses for the FTSE MIB in Italy and the CAC 40. Now, a maternity ward and children's ward in the southern Ukrainian city of Mariupol have been bombed. That's according to Ukrainian officials. They say a Russian airstrike is responsible for the attack. President Zelensky has called the bombing a war crime. An aerial bomb on a maternity hospital is the conclusive evidence that what is happening is a genocide of Ukrainians. Europeans, you won't be able to say that you didn't see what happened to Ukrainians in Mariupol. You saw, you know. Consequently, you must strengthen sanctions against Russia so that it never has the chance to continue this genocide. You need to pressure Russia so that it sits at the negotiating table and ends this barbarous war. Now, this morning, Turkey is hosting a meeting with the Ukrainian foreign minister and his Russian counterpart. The two sides will try to negotiate a ceasefire in the highest profile meeting between the nations since the start of the conflict. Joining us now is Tom McKenzie at the Polish-Ukrainian border and Bloomberg's international government editor, Ross Matheson. So, Ross, uh, talks underway in Turkey, of course, between the Russian and Ukrainian foreign ministers. Do we know if both sides are ready for a diplomatic solution? Well, certainly both sides say they're willing to talk, but there's a huge gulf between their demands for what each side would accept in order to de-escalate this conflict. Of course, Ukraine has gone into this conversation this morning saying there are three things that they want that they'll insist upon. One is a ceasefire, a full ceasefire, which so far has failed to hold even in limited fashion for a few hours to enable humanitarian corridors. Secondly, they want Russian troops completely out of Ukraine to pull out uh, entirely. That's also on the table. And then they want uh, security guarantees, of course, from the West uh, to protect them in that scenario. You can imagine a lot of the things that Ukraine will put on the table today, Russia will say, is simply not feasible. In turn, Russia is demanding things that Ukraine won't agree to, including the demilitarization of the country and a guarantee that it won't move closer to Europe. So we, we, we've got expectations pretty low for this meeting, even though it is the highest level one so far, the question is, what does it pave the way toward? Does it pave the way toward yeah. further conversations, negotiations around what could be a proper ceasefire? And eventually, does it pave the way potentially for a meeting between their leaders, which is what the Ukrainian president says is needed to end this once and for all? Uh, Rosen, does that depend on whether the war is going Putin's way or not? It's unclear whether if, you know, if he feels like he's losing, he's hardening or the other way around. <laughs> 
Well, certainly so far, the Ukrainian president has called for weeks and weeks, even before the war began, to meet and talk directly with Vladimir Putin. He said the Russian president would not take his call, was not willing to speak to him, and they never had a chance to meet. You can imagine if the war is, is, is bogged down, really, the military and the Russia side are struggling on the ground. But is that the moment that Vladimir Putin wants to be sitting down and talking with the Ukrainian president directly? Does it look like perhaps he's then climbing down or losing face or going into that conversation on the back foot, potentially. So is there a great motivation for him to meet face-to-face uh, -face at the moment? Potentially not, at least until the situation as he would see it might be more advantageous for him in terms of the actual fighting. Yeah, Ross, thank you. And Tom, what's the latest on aid spending for Ukraine? You're at the border between Ukraine and Poland. Uh, yeah, Francine, I mean, I'll talk about what's happening right here on the ground at one of just many, of course, border crossings. This is Medica uh, on the border, of course, between Poland and uh, Ukraine. Behind me, you can see uh, the checkpoint for the lorries and cars that are going across into Ukraine. A lot of that will be with supplies for the refugees that are lining up to cross over the border. There are also, I should say, men who are crossing over, Ukrainians crossing over to join the fight in Ukraine. We've met uh, a couple of those uh, just in the last couple of days. On the other side, there's the pedestrian crossing, and we are seeing this morning, just in the last few hours, hundreds of refugees joining and crossing this border. And again, the majority are women, children, and the elderly. The Polish military is here, the Polish police are here, and volunteers from across Europe. It's very rudimentary, it's very ad hoc. There are tents, there's food, and there's some clothing. But there's freezing temperatures here. The conditions are very challenging indeed for people who have traveled two or three days to get here, and then the logistics of moving on. The uncertainty uh, for these people is profound. At the top level, we are seeing the funding starting to come through, and we saw that certainly uh, from the United States, the House of Representatives, Francine, signing off on about $13.5 billion of aid, and a lot of that will go mm -hmm. towards the refugees and humanitarian effort here uh, in Eastern Europe. Thank you both for joining us. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, of course, on the ground for us, and Aras Matheson, who's in charge of all of our government reporting. Now, to look at the markets, to look at what this means for ECB, what it means for inflation forecast, and the possibility of stagflation, we're joined by John Bilton, head of global multi asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. John, thank you so much for joining us. I have like a million and one questions because it's true that over the last 13, we 13 days, not only have our lives really, you know, been glued to our screens and trying to watch the situation on the ground, but if you're in the markets, or if you're in business, your forecasts have all gone out the window. Well, I think what we have to do is separate the headline risk and some of yeah. the horrendous things we're seeing going on across our screens, of course, are driving sentiment in real time. But at the same time, what we've got to think through is what does this mean for the growth function? What does it mean for inflation? What does it mean for the policy reaction function? And yes, it's very difficult not to look at what is turning out to be a significant price shock across a wide range of commodities. Um, not translating through to a little bit of a challenge for consumers. And it's, but it's uneven across different regions. A little bit of a challenge? <clears throat> or if you look at some of the prices that we've seen in diesel and gas prices in oil, I mean, if they stay at these levels, this is not a little bit of a challenge. This is inflation up 10%. Well, let's put this into context. We took a look at our numbers. We took a look at our economic numbers. And, yeah, it's, we've cut our numbers for our European growth expectations yep. significantly. How we, much? Um, we're down by about 3%. So what was a Okay. big uplift following the easing of Omicron has now become a couple of quarters of flat growth. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing Europe under some pressure. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the global picture, there's much more translation um, of... Uh, there's, there's much less translation, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so we've taken our numbers down, but only by a couple of tenths. There is much more resilience in consumer balance sheets coming into this yeah. crisis than we've seen previously when we've been looking at a contraction. So okay. we do think that balance sheets are strong yep. and can weather rather a lot of this price increase. I mean, we have a great earnings chart, which I, I'm going to get to in a second. Mm. But if you look at earnings, are, are they not going to have to downgrade? Again, the second round effects and the third round effects we're Absolutely. still trying to work through. Well, this is the point, and this is why we, we need to look beyond the headlines and we need to think about what it does to grow. Earnings, absolutely. We're seeing cost pressure going up. Normally, margins are pro-cyclical. You get nominal growth, it lifts revenues and yep. costs. This time, we've got a growth shock, we've yep. got a sentiment shock hit hitting revenues, and yep. we've got costs going up across the board. It's really acute for industrials, it's acute yep. for Europe. 
less so for the U.S. Okay, John, we'll talk a lot more about that. That's one of my favorite charts, actually, looking at uh, some of the earnings forecast and what this means going forward. John Bilton from J.P. Morgan stays with us. Also, Amazon. This was one of the most significant corporate news that we saw and that we've seen, actually, in the last two months, a bit buried in the news because of everything that's going on with inflation expectations. But uh, Amazon yesterday um, announcing some pretty big moves, and you can see the stock split and the buyback plan uh, impacting, of course, the share price just mechanically or technically. Technically, now Amazon getting some 6.8%. Coming up, we continue to check on the markets and the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine with JP Morgan's John Bilton. Also, Bloomberg's Lynn Thomason joins us. This is Bloomberg. For your business audience and watching Bloomberg, uh, they should know that there is no successful investment in Russia or engagement with Russia as long as Vladimir Putin is in charge of it. Well, that was a former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker, warning the business community about the dangers of investing in Putin's Russia. Now, we're also getting some breaking news out of Roman Abramovich, uh, one of the oligarchs here based in the U.K. The U.K. government is now saying that the owner of the Chelsea Football Club has his assets frozen. Now, what this means, and we've heard about 20 bids to try and buy Chelsea from various people, various billionaires, really, across the world, it's unclear. He had said about 10 days ago that he was putting Chelsea football club in a trust. This was not 100% confirmed and we don't know whether it's lock solid. So we're unclear at the moment if these newly sanctioned or new sanctions by the UK include, of course, the football club of Chelsea, Chelsea FC. I know a lot of fans, but also a lot of investors will want to try and get to the bottom of that. The other person that has been targeting in these extra sanctions is Mr. Oleg Deripaska, who had been sanctioned in the past by the US. So, uh, again, unclear how much real estate, how, man, how many things Mr. Deripaska has here in the UK, but certainly Mr. Abramovich, Roman Abramovich, the owner of Chelsea Football Club, is what we're really trying to get to the bottom of, what it means for his assets and what it means for the sale of the club. So let's get back to John Bilton from J.P. Morgan. John, I want to talk about inflation. I don't know whether, you know, we'll see many more sanctions and, again, whether you model this. We heard from the U.S. House of Representatives in the U.S., that, you know, both sides want more punishment for Russia. We hear now the U.K., you know, freezing the assets of Mr. Abramovich. How far can this go? Well, I think we've got to look at what we can model economically. Right. It, this is a time of huge uncertainty yeah. and trying to model off of the volatility of headlines and responses to those headlines I think is you know, something that's difficult to do. What we can look at is what's the effect on growth, what's the effect on consumer, what's the effect on earnings. And that's exactly you, what the policy makers want to do. Can you model energy prices given the, the wild gyrations that we've seen? At the moment what we can do is we have some understanding of where supply could come from. This is one of the reasons markets have been very mobile. You, know, you had some commentary from OPEC since road back. There's the question as to whether we get a shale response. Yeah. So, you know, we, we know where the oil is, but ultimately what we have to follow is whether those taps are going to be um, unleashed. How difficult is it to model, you know, China's response into all of this? Because this could be the real game changer. If they buy Russian oil, if they start being much more tricky and, you know, peddling misinformation. Again, there's a lot of what ifs in this. And yeah. what we're looking for is can we come down yeah. to understanding how has this affected trend growth? And what we can say is that if we look at it across Europe, if we look at it across the US, trend growth, potential growth, mm -hmm. is roughly where it was. We have the same productivity and people within those economies. What we don't have at the same time is, is the surety on, on cyclicalities. That's one of the reasons yeah. why we've taken our European numbers down you know, to project a couple of relatively flat quarters of growth. And to be clear, that is a massive cut, the biggest that I've seen us do outside of the coronavirus crisis. So this is a serious issue for European growth. But crucially, as we move more towards the medium term, what we have to think about is the response in terms of inflation, how that affects earnings. And it will look yeah. worse for industrial companies, in our view, than necessarily it will for perhaps 
financial companies. So there are already seems to be some dislocations creeping through the market yeah. that we have to think about in earnings terms. So, John, do you just sell, for example, the companies in Carlsberg was a case in point today saying, look, we can't guide forward just because of our exposure to Russia. I mean, those are companies that we pretty much knew who they were. Do you just stay away from those and kind of work on the rest? Well, I think, again, it's I'm not I don't get into the level of individual securities. Fair. But certainly yeah. at the top level, yeah. what we can say is if you look at the banks within the Eurozone, in the immediate aftermath of the crisis of, the, of, of this conflict, they sold off faster than they have at any time in any crisis over the last 25 yes. years. But the banks themselves had already well discounted not only a recession but also some of the exposures. We think that the balance sheets are solid. So this is a, a sector which has probably gone okay. too far. Industrial firms, for instance, instead, will face persistent cost pressures. So if we look further out, what we have to recalibrate for is not today's headlines, but what some of the lingering impacts of costs and margins are going to be. So you just buy US tech? Well, this is a world where we've got real interest rates now going back down to where they were at the beginning of the year. And if you think back to pre-crisis during January, a lot of the sell-off in tech came at the same time we saw real interest rates moving upwards. Now, the Fed are still probably going to raise rates, but with inflation picking up, those real rates are back down. And that starts to sort of throw the cards in the air a little bit. Tech has derated a long way. It's a you know, good earner. It's a decent cash flow area. So it's something that's definitely worth looking at. John, something that would make the ECB's life a lot easier is if we have some kind of stimulus package from EU leaders. I don't know whether you see or you know foresee the chance of some kind of big coordinated package like we saw at the beginning of COVID when we didn't really know what we dealt with. And does that change your view on, on growth? OK, let's separate a couple of things out. What we got within, with COVID was we got the Fed, the ECB, Bank of England, you name it, the, yep. the whole list of central banks creating massive monetary stimulus. And that changed the game. In this particular time, we don't have that option. This will not be solved by a massive monetary package. But make no mistake, the fiscal response from Europe so far has yeah. been significant. Think about the de de decision that they could issue joint bonds. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even considered during the Eurozone crisis. This is a much more joined up and fiscally coordinated yeah. Europe than I think we've ever seen. John, thank you so much. John Bilton, their head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The U.S. House has passed a long-delayed $1.5 trillion spending bill that funds the U.S. government for the rest of the fiscal year. The bill will also provide more than $13 billion to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The late-night vote followed a day of political drama that saw emergency coronavirus funding removed from the measure. Now, Ukraine says it's open to discussing Russia's demand of neutrality as long as it's given security guarantees, although it won't surrender any territory to Moscow. In an interview with Bloomberg, a top foreign policy aide to President Vladimir Zelensky laid out Ukraine's preconditions for talks with an immediate ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian troops, the very top priority. If you ask me whether there is a diplomatic solution, surely we are ready for the diplomatic solution. You know, there, are, there were three rounds of negotiations already on the level of delegation. Tomorrow, our Minister of Foreign Affairs will meet together with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. But very important that my president is ready to have the direct negotiations with President Putin. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Huge news from the UK sanctioning Roman Abramovich, but also Oleg Deripaska. Now, the UK government announced, of course, that Roman Abramovich assets have been frozen. That prohibits a transaction with these UK individuals and businesses. It also will enforce a travel ban and transport sanctions have been imposed. Now, what we need to understand is what this means for sales of Chelsea Football Club. He said just last week that that would be for sale. Some of the other individuals that have been sanctioned, Oleg Deripaska, who has stakes in N Plus Group, Igor Sechin, the chief executive of Rosneft, and Andrei Kostin, the chairman of VTB Bank. Now, what could be linked or what also is something that we need to keep an eye on, unclear whether this is a direct link of N plus because Oleg Deripaska has stakes in that, but aluminium is actually extending gains on the LME, uh, gaining now as much as 5.8%. We'll have plenty more, of course, on these sanctions and repercussion on metals. This is 
Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's take a look at stocks on the move with our Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. Well, stocks struggling to have any follow through from yesterday's bounce. The best performing sector yesterday, autos, is the worst performer today. Yesterday, it posts 9.5% gain, now down almost by 3%. Also, some warning for corporates. Carlsberg removing their 2022 guidance over Russia. Credit Suisse warning about the impact to their business due to the war as well, Francine. Yeah, thank you so much, Danny Berger. Also, the UK just minutes ago sanctioning Roman Abramovich, sanctioning Oleg Deripaska. That's sending also aluminium soaring. And what is at stake is the fate of Chelsea Football Club as well. We'll have plenty more on that. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the market's really on a tear. They're trying to figure out what all of these extra sanctions mean for the U.S., what it means for a lot of these oligarchs. So we look at the meeting between Ukrainian and Russian officials in Turkey. We'll have plenty more on that throughout the day. Now, the big story, of course, is U.S. futures, Europe stocks falling on this inflation fear. So we've seen a, quite a big reversal in the last couple of hours, given where we we are overall equity indices, futures and European stocks falling amid concern that U.S. inflation may have accelerated for a six month. Investors turning to the European Central Bank to gauge policymakers response to the war in Ukraine. Now, the picture overall is, of course, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the resultant sanctions have sparked a disruption in commodity markets. We've been talking about it all week, sparking concern of inflation surging further and global growth sinking even lower. Over the last couple of minutes, we also had more news out of sanctions from the UK. Uh, Oleg Deripaska having a stake of around 45 percent in EN Plus, the biggest aluminium producer in Russia, and that's sent aluminium prices also soaring on the LME. Now, Ukrainian officials say a Russian airstrike has hit a children's hospital in Mariupol. President Zelensky calls on the European nations to strengthen their sanctions. The UK sanctions Chelsea, or the UK sanctions Chelsea's owner Roman Abramovich and Russell's Oleg Deripaska. Bridgen says it has targeted seven Russian billionaires. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on that throughout the day. The markets, we just went through it. Let's also check on crude oil to see a picture of what that means exactly for um, a lot of the inflation concerns and actually what the ECB can do. What can they do in terms of fighting inflation? This is the number one concern. And what central banks can do or cannot do is, first of all, they need to weigh up the economic impact of the fallout of Russia's invasion of of Ukraine. Now, that will have, of course, an impact on what we're looking across the board with a lot of these commodity prices. So, the ECB set to decide how we can shield the continent's economy from the consequences of the war in Ukraine while navigating an unprecedented inflation shock that shows no sign of abating. We're, see, we're now uh, joined by Silvia Ardania, head of European Economics Research at Barclays. Silvia, thank you for joining us. When you look at, first of all, the limited impact that the ECB, that the Fed can have on inflation if we are in a stagflationary environment. What can they do today to make the situation better or at least not to exacerbate an already bad situation? Good morning and thanks for having me. Look, we think that certainly the trade-offs that the ECB faces are quite complicated, but not to make the situation worse. We think the ECB will be very prudent and take a step-by-step -step approach. With that, we mean that they are likely to uh, scale down QE, as they announced in December, but also communicate to markets that, if needed, they're ready to adjust the policy stance in both directions to maintain price and financial stability. And in that, I think they will recognize also that, as you said, Francine, this war will have an economic cost and growth will be lower. So I think it's important also to, for, for the central bank to say that in the absence of second round effect, in the absence of 
uh, wage price spirals, which we don't have in the euro area. Uh, it is important that the policy stance prevents uh, you know, the economic fallout to become even bigger. Um, Sylvia, are, are you expecting the ECB to actually postpone the end of its asset purchase program? Look, the uh, announcement in December was uh, for uh, QE to go down to 40 billion now, 30 billion uh, in the third quarter, and then 20 billion on an open ended framework. And that's mm -hmm. our call. We think we'll stay with that, which means that relative to what we learned in February, yes, they will postpone the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then, as I said, I think they will, um, pro they will basically play, you know, as, as events unfold. But for now, leaving the 20 any billion open-ended will signal to markets that they are clearly in no hurry to hike rates this year. Sylvia, how difficult is it to, you know, have a forecast that holds when it comes to inflation? So I know we're expecting uh, updates from the ECB on that, but how do you try and, and keep up actually with the story that's, you know, going so fast? Even today, aluminium on the LME gain 5%, and that of course has a repercussion on the supply chain and how, you know, how much people will pay for cars and how much people will pay for their washing machines. Yeah, it's definitely not easy. We, we look at changes on the financial markets and we do bottom-up approach and tend to incorporate that. We have all upgraded our forecast, you know, repeatedly this year. And so this is going to become more a challenge. But I would say that it's also difficult to, to understand the impact on economic activity. And there will be negative impact because, uh, one, as inflation becomes stronger and stronger, uh, consumers' real disposable income falls, confidence decreases, and so demand will, will, will be affected through this channel. And on the other hand, the supply chain bottlenecks will have a, an impact in, on production. Uh, you know, like we, we learned during COVID when there were bottlenecks, uh, industrial production falls because of lack of materials. So the growth impact is, I would say, as important as the inflation impact. Of course, the combination of these weaker economies and higher input costs means that earnings are also something we need to watch out for. How does that filter through your longer term economic, European economic outlook? Look, uh, again, we, we, you know, in the longer term for now, it's, uh, you know, the, our own forecast is that, uh, you know, if you look toward the second half of 2023, 2024, uh, we have a normalization, right, both in terms of growth and in terms of inflation picture. I think from the ECB, we will learn how do they see that through their 2024 forecast. And there, with inflation, we think that they will still leave it, you know, in a range of 1.82%, so that they can signal that, again, because the slowdown in economic activity is going also to happen, uh, the medium-term inflation forecast will not be changed and will still be a target. Uh, Sylvia, what do they do with euro and actually how much, you know, of unconventional monetary policy, given we're in a time of war, can the ECB do? Look, when we speak about unconventional monetary policy, we think QE is the first instrument, uh, and then obviously they have a TLTRO. So on QE, uh, if the situation were to, uh, you know, worsen significantly, both in terms of financial stability or in terms of, you know, price stability in the medium term because the economic fallout is, is stronger, then they could, uh, you know, step up QE. In our view, they could start another program that is uh, as flexible as PEP was to prevent, for example, financial fragmentations. They can also use the TLTR also to provide liquidity to market and, uh, and support banks. Uh, the 50 basis point subsidies is due to uh, expire in June uh, on the TLTR also. We think the ECB will extend that um, either at this meeting or in, in April. So, and on uh, the so euro, the one scene, of... uh, again, obviously. Yeah, I was going to ask you about euro. <laughs> you, you asked, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to reply. The ECB, no, no, I was going uh, to ask. <laughs> Just another dilemma for the ECB. How do they deal with uh, the euro's recent fall? Look, I mean, uh, th they will say that they don't target interest rate, obviously, and uh, uh, sorry, exchange rate, and uh, and obviously, um, yes, you know, a weaker euro doesn't help, uh, you know, the the, the, the inflation picture. But at the same time, it's a byproduct of what's going on, and uh, I don't think the ECB can really do much about that.
All right, thank you so much, as always, for your insights. Uh, Silvia Ardania, thank you. Head of European Economics Research at Barclays, of course, on ECB Day. Now, we'll have plenty more on some of the sanctions that the UK government has put in place from Robin Abramovich and Oleg Deripaska. If you look at the implications of this, it could have huge implications on the price of aluminium, or if not huge, it could have an implication on the price of aluminium. I think currently gaining some 5.8%. This is because Oleg Deripaska owns a big chunk of the largest Russian aluminium producer and then the big question is what happens also to Chelsea Football Club given that Roman Abramovich has now his assets frozen so we'll have plenty more on that shortly this is Bloomberg Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, in the last 15 minutes, we found out from the UK government that they will sanction seven individuals, including Roman Abramovich and Oleg Deripaska. Now, Mr. Abramovich sees his assets frozen, a prohibition of transactions with UK individuals and businesses, a travel ban and transport sanctions imposed. He is, of course, the owner of Chelsea Football Club and holder of stakes in Evraz and Norals Nickel. This is significant because we had understood that Chelsea Football Club was up for sale from our own reporting. And our David Helier will, of course, come on shortly to uh, walk us through exactly what this means. But we understood that there were at least 20 bids out there to try and gain control of this, you know, UK jewel. And it's unclear now with the sanctions whether it makes it much more difficult or not. Oleg Deripaska also has stakes, huge stakes, in EN Plus, one of the biggest, I think actually the biggest, Russian aluminium maker. On the back of that, aluminium uh, was up 5%, now up 3.8%, but actually I was looking at a two-month, three-month chart for aluminium, and it really has seen quite a lot of volatility. Now, Russian finances will be eroded by sanctions, but the economy may continue to run at a current account surplus. That's according to Algebris. Russia's economic strategy remains viable so long as energy remains exempt from some global sanctions. Skyrocketing energy prices coupled with the collapse in imports due to the fall of the ruble naturally produce a windfall that allows Russia to pay for its external debt and replenish its foreign exchange reserves. Now, that's according to a new policy piece by Silvia Merler, head of policy research and ESG and Algebra. Silvia, thank you so much for joining us. What I love about your research is that, it, you know, it goes a, a little bit away from the grain and it really studies the implications of some of these sanctions that the West and other countries thought it would cripple the Russian economy. But actually, if you analyze it in, you know, in detail, it maybe doesn't cripple it as much as we think it does. Sure, um, certainly not as fast, I think, as we uh, were anticipating. Obviously, we have seen, uh, in terms of macroeconomic policy, the Russian economy, you could say, has done a U-turn uh, back to 20 years in the space of just two weeks. So this is obviously going to have an impact on the economy. Um, there will be a recession, inflation will be very high. This will have a uh, profound impact uh, on, on the Russian people and on the, on the Russian economy. But from a purely financial side, from a purely external financial side, um, as long as, as you were saying, Russia is able to export its energy, then um, the combination of especially high energy prices and the collapse of imports due to the fall of the ruble will mechanically produce a current account surplus that is um, almost twice as large as okay. the external debt redemption that are, that are coming uh, due in the next 12 months. So that's um, a condition that will enable Russia to replenish some of those uh, foreign effects reserves that we know are now inaccessible due to the sanctions that have been imposed on the Russian central banks. But, um, uh, Sylvia, if Russia is heading for a major inflation shock, is there anything that the central bank at this point can do? Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you very well, Francine. Could you repeat that question? Sylvia, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, so if, if, we're go if you're looking at a massive inflation spike in Russia, like a shock, is there anything that Nibelin and the central bank can do at, at this point to, to you know, make well, it easier on the Russian economy? Well, it's very difficult 
it's very difficult to counteract that shock. And I think the central bank has been uh, explicit in the fact that due to the sanctions that have imposed on their access to foreign exchange reserves, um, um, using the typical channels of, mo of uh, monetary policy becomes a lot more difficult for the Russian central bank. And so counter uh, counteracting this effect on the Russian economy is going to be a lot more complicated than it would normally be. So this is already uh, showing that that particular piece of the sanctions that I think was the most unexpected expected and also the most severe is uh, definitely having an impact in making it a lot more complicated for uh, the monetary authority to react to this major shock that they're experiencing. But Sylvia, even if you know sanctions are hardened by the US, the UK, Europe and other countries and they ban 100% oil embargoes and of course the problem in Europe is that we'd be hit you know, quite significantly which is why we're seeing a lot of leaders in Europe saying no we don't want that. What role can China play in tempering that shock? So I think um, there's two really two phases to that question. Um, one phase is whether this is going to happen particularly on the European side. Uh, because if you look at the cost, of course, um, sanctions are to some extent uh, self-harming, uh, particularly when it comes to energy. Um, our estimate is that if you were to try and replace um, 60 percent of Russian gas that we currently import to the EU to um, try and, and, repl and replace it uh, with LNG, for example, or other sources, your energy bill would uh, go, go up by five to six times. So that's really a major price impact, a uh, major cost for the European economy. And even so, there are questions to the feasibility of re replacing that huge amount of gas in such a short period of time. So there will probably be some demand curtailment that will be necessary that will impose a further negative uh, shock on the European economy. When it comes to the substitutions of whether um, Russia can redirect part of its gas elsewhere. I think there's two things to say. One is we are observing some uh, self-sanctioning, particularly on oil, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but that might uh, might expand to other com commodities that Russia exports um, with uh, yeah. even uh, commodities or um, segments of the markets that have not been sanctioned that are self-sanctioning in a way. And when it comes to redirecting yeah. to China, that's definitely possible. I don't think it's possible in a major amount in terms of quantity due to infrastructural issues that are present there with the pipelines not being uh, completed towards the east. So that might limit the, the feasibility of this. And also in terms of the price, and so it's likely that that substitution will happen at a much lower price than the price that's currently paid by Europeans. Yeah, we're looking at live pictures of Antalya, Turkey, where we're expecting the foreign ministers of Russia and the foreign ministers of Ukraine to meet and then give to individual press conferences. I mean, how much of a headache is this for the ECB? I mean, we know it's a headache and there's huge dilemmas, there's huge uncertainties. But what kind of policy, Sylvia, can they put in place now to, to cushion up an even further uh, energy shock if there were to be a total ban on Russian exports? I mean, the ECB is literally stuck between a rock and a hard place right now because if you look at conditions um, and inflation prints that came out, um, the latest infl inflation print that came out, if we were not in a wartime uh, scenario, then that would definitely uh, call for uh, tightening. We are in a wartime scenario, so that changes obviously everything. Um, particularly when it comes to anticipating the potential negative shock to demand, so potential recessionary effects from higher energy prices and uh, possible uh, production curtailment to reduce the amount of energy across Europe. So I think uh, the ECB will probably be in a wait and see mode, uh, try to trying to avoid um, tilting too much on one side or the yeah. other, but it's definitely something that's going to put them in a very tight position. Sylvia, thank you so much. Sylvia Merler, their head of policy research and ESG at Algebra, joining us this morning. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Amazon plans to split its stock for the first time in more than two decades. The move will end an era of four-digit share prices for U.S. tech giants after similar moves by peers like Alphabet and Apple. Amazon shares surged in late trade on the plan to divide its stock by a 20-to-1 ratio. It is also 
authorizing a $10 billion buyback. Now, Rio Tinto has announced plans to cut ties to Russia. A company spokesperson says it is in the process of terminating all commercial relationships with any business from the country. Rio operates an Ulumia refinery in Australia in partnership with Roussel, which holds a 20% stake. The miner did not confirm whether the joint venture would be impacted. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, coming up, the UK has hit seven Russian oligarchs with sanctions. That story next. This is Bloomberg. Now, we're expecting to have two simultaneous press conferences from Turkey, one from Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba. I think he's just starting right now. The other with his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. Highest profile talks between the two nations at war since the start of the conflict. I think when the Foreign Minister of Ukraine will start speaking, maybe we'll listen in to see exactly the nature of the talks and what we found out so far. I think he's just speaking now, so maybe let's listen in for a couple of minutes. Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov and Turkish Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu. It lasted for about an hour and a half. And first of all, I would like to thank Minister Çavuşoğlu for putting this meeting together. It was not easy, but uh, he succeeded in facilitating this contact, this first ever contact between Russian and Ukrainian foreign ministers since the beginning of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. This meeting was both, uh, this conversation was both uh, easy and difficult. Uh, easy because Minister Lavrov basically followed his uh, traditional narratives about Ukraine. Difficult because I did my best to at least uh, find uh, a diplomatic solution to the humanitarian tragedy unfolding in, uh, the, uh, on the battleground and in the besieged cities. The most tragic situation is currently now in the city of Mariupol, on the Sea of Azov. The city is being bombarded from the air. It's being hit by artillery fire. And I came here with a humanitarian purpose, to walk out from the meeting with the decision to arrange a humanitarian corridor in and from Mariupol, from Mariupol for uh, civilians who want to flee this uh, area of fear and struggle and humanitarian corridor to, to bring in Mariupol humanitarian aid. Unfortunately, Minister Lavrov was not in a position to uh, commit himself to it, but he uh, will correspond with respective uh, authorities on this issue. We also raised the issue of a ceasefire, 24-hour ceasefire, to resolve the most pressing humanitarian issues. Uh, we did not make progress on this since uh, it seems that there are other decision makers uh, for, this, uh, for this matter in Russia. We agreed to continue uh, efforts. That was the foreign minister of Ukraine saying that they have not made any headway in those conversations in Turkey. More Bloomberg surveillance early edition next. This is Bloomberg. We are not trading Ukrainian territories, not a single inch. If Putin is not stopped in Ukraine, there would be terrible implications for European and global security. 
an aerial bomb of a maternity hospital is the conclusive evidence that what is happening is a genocide of Ukrainians. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, March 10th. Our top stories today. The U.S. House passes a spending bill that includes 13.6 billion U.S. dollars for the war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign minister says no progress was made in ceasefire talks with Russia today. The battle against inflation, the fighting in Ukraine, will complicate the ECB's policy decision today. In the U.S., the monthly CPI report will give an idea of just how fast prices are rising. And it's become a big tech blueprint. Amazon is the latest to announce a stock split plan. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everybody. This is the early edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in, in New York. And Kaylee, the geopolitics developing thick and fast this morning, whether that's the talks taking place in Turkey, the sanctions coming through from the UK. Mm. Lots to discuss then uh, as this fast-paced uh, story continues to roll on. From a market's perspective, the rally in risk, the rush in risk assets, it went around the world and now it stalls. Yeah, it did not stall in Asia overnight, though, Anna. Of course, we have the geopolitical considerations today. We also have economic considerations with the ECB on deck and CPI here in the U.S. as well. So it's going to be one of those days. As for how the session shook out in Asia overnight, it was really playing catch up to the rebound rally we saw in Europe and the U.S. yesterday. That was the best day since 2020. And it was also the best day since November of 2020 when it comes to the MSCI Asia Pacific Index. It was up more than 2.5% overnight. You had stocks in Japan higher, Hong Kong higher. Uh, and China as well, but it really was Japan that was the outperformer. Both the Topics and the Nikkei 225 higher by around four percentage points, their best day since July of 2020. Part of that was just the broader rebound in risk assets. Part of it too, though, may be the Japanese yen weaker against the dollar for the fourth day in a row. It's actually at the weakest level in about a month, around 115.95. And elsewhere in Asian FX, I just wanted to point to the South Korean won, Matt. That is the big outperformer today after the conservative candidate uh, Yoon suk Yeol won the presidential election. That boosting the yuan, or the yuan, excuse me, Matt, it's stronger against the dollar by about half of 1%, around 1228. All right, watching that uh, closely, also watching what's going on in terms of U.S. futures. After the incredible swings that we've had, right, over the past few sessions, I think we were down almost 3% on Monday. We were up more than 2.5% yesterday's close in cash. S&P futures right now down about half a percent. The U.S. 10-year yield also coming down as investors are buying that, so there's more of a risk-off feel today. 192.88, the level still relatively high. Uh, NYMEX crude right now bouncing back $4, 450 to 113.28. The swings there have been insane as well, with Brent all the way up at 139, at one point all the way down at 105. Um, and Bitcoin coming off 6.5%. Remember yesterday we were up 10% uh, to over 42,000. Now we're back under 40,000 at 39,173. So just the volatility really continues here, Anna. What do you see in Europe? Yeah, the volatility, the realized volatility on the DAX, for example, Matt, uh, the poster child for this, not uh, it's at levels we haven't seen since 2011. Well, this is today's picture. It is weaker. We're down by more than 2% on the CAC and the DAX. But as you say, Matt, that's after a real, uh, a, a, whole, a whole wave of volatility this week and after incredible gains yesterday. We were up by more than 7% on the Euro stocks 50 yesterday. The DAX was up by nearly 8% in session yesterday. So we must think about these losses in the context of those stellar gains the day before. Uh, Euro dollar, worth keeping an eye on, of course, because we're going to hear from the ECB a little bit later, more from our colleagues on that front as we go through the programme. How will they balance, uh, of course, the concerns around growth on the European continent, but also the threat of inflation? Uh, I put in here aluminum prices. This is the London listing of aluminum, and it's up by 4%. It's been up by more than 5% earlier on. We heard from London authorities, the London government sanctioning a number of wealthy Russians with, con with ties, connections to the Kremlin today. One of them is Oleg Deripaska. He is, of course, an investor in EN+, Plus, which is an aluminium business, aluminium business uh, listed here in London and over in Russia. Rio Tinto is up, by, is sorry, down by seven uh, seven percent. This is another business joining that long list of companies that are severing ties with Russian operations. They don't have people working there, but they certainly had a JV uh, that is now thrown into question. Also, ex dividend on that one, I should mention. And Carlsberg down by more than four percent. This is the biggest brewing business, Kaylee, in Russia, and they have had to withdraw their guidance. And they say they are reviewing their operations in that particular geography, of course.
All right, Anna, a lot of individual movers and company stories to watch today. Now, what else is ahead today in terms of the macro picture? Of course, we will be getting that ECB rate decision at 7.45 a.m. New York time, followed shortly thereafter by U.S. CPI data at 8.30 a.m. New York time. 7.9% on the year-on-year -year number is what we're looking for. And finally, EU leaders are also meeting in Versailles, France, for an informal summit. The three main topics on the table, bolstering defense, reducing energy dependence on Russia, and the economic impact from the war, Matt. All right, we're going to continue to follow all those so much happening today. Let's get the latest with our team coverage from around the world. Our reporters in D.C., Paris and Poland. We'll start with Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter in Washington. Jack, last night a House passed a spending bill that funds the U.S. government and provides $13.6 billion to respond to the war in Ukraine. This is a $1.5 trillion bill. Get us up to speed on the details. Uh, top line takeaways are pretty big increases in government funding, 6.7% uh, increase in all non-defense spending, 5.6% in defense spending. It does have that $13.6 billion supplemental measure for Ukraine. Uh, almost half of that is paying back def uh, Department of Defense coffers for what they've provided already. Uh, but there is uh, a little more than a billion in humanitarian relief, uh, about $4 billion overall for the Department of State. Uh, members I've talked to, such as Chris Murphy, who are focused on this, say this is what's needed now for Ukraine. There very well could be another bill uh, as humanitarian or defense needs increase. It does not have the COVID relief that the White House requested. They wanted $15.7 billion. There was a hang up on how to offset those costs and whether they'd take money away from state governments. So there's going to be some work on that next week. Uh, but for now, the broader government funding package and Ukraine aid goes to the Senate and they're trying to get this done by Friday night's deadline. It, it may be a weekend vote instead though. Jack, thank you very much. Jack Fitzpatrick, our government reporter in Washington. Meanwhile, here in the UK, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has announced sanctions on seven individuals, including Roman Abramovich, as part of the UK's efforts to isolate Putin and those around him. These individuals, who have a collective net worth of around £15 billion, will have their assets in the UK frozen. They are banned from travelling here, and no UK citizen or company may do business with them. We'll have more on this sanction story later this hour. Uh, Russian uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with his Ukrainian counterpart in Turkey today. Uh, they said, and the, the Ukrainian side has said that no progress was made. Kuleba said that Russia is seeking a surrender and Ukraine won't surrender. Zelensky's Deputy Chief of Staff spoke to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo about the next stages of the war. Many people ask whether Ukraine is ready to discuss uh, the neutrality status. The answer is yes, but at the same time, together with this discussion, the talk should be about hard security guarantees for Ukraine in this case. What does, mean? what does it mean? It means that all the neighbors of Ukraine, including Russia, together with big states such as US, uh, Great Britain, Germany, Turkey, and some others, should give us strict guarantees of Ukraine's security. That was Ihor Zovkova speaking to our colleague, uh, European correspondent Maria Tadeo, who is in Paris for us now. Uh, and Maria, you're in Paris, of course, because European leaders are going to be meeting there at a summit which takes place uh, in, in nearby Versailles. What can we expect? Well, Anna, you see that the diplomatic effort continues here. We had a very important meeting in Turkey today uh, between the Russian foreign minister and the Ukrainian foreign minister. The location of this meeting in Turkey also very key. Remember, in that interview that I did yesterday with a very close advisor to Zelensky, he did say, if we were to drop our NATO membership bid, we want security guarantees from all of our neighbors, and that would include Turkey. So the timing and the location is very, very important in the story. Now, when it comes to today here in Paris, now European leaders are going to be meeting. There is going to be a big discussion on sanctions. There's also going to be a big discussion on how much to spend for defense. And of course, another one that could be controversial is the future of Ukraine in the European Union. Remember, the Ukrainians say they want to join the European Union and the EU should fast track this application. I want to make it clear if you're a member of the EU, it does not make you a member of NATO automatically. But we know the split's opinion in the European Union. Some that argue, given the fight and given how ugly this has been for Ukraine for two weeks and they've managed to resist, they deserve this membership. Others argue it's time to really reflect and not take actions that could escalate this war.
All right, thank you to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Paris. And don't miss her interview with the Estonian Prime Minister. That's coming up at 6.45 a.m. New York time. Meanwhile, we're still getting headlines out of the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba saying that Russia conveyed it will continue to attack until its demands are met. And of course, the attack has led to quite the humanitarian crisis. So let's get the latest from the Polish-Ukrainian border. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie is there on the ground. Tom, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Uh, yeah, Kelly, look, you've been talking about the sanctions, you've been talking about the aid and the relief uh, that is being agreed at the top level amongst governments. All of that, of course, underpinned by the very real human story that's unfolding, of course, in Ukraine, just a couple of hundred metres that way, but also here on the border as refugees continue to cross. And just in the last few hours, we've seen hundreds of women, children and elderly men continuing to cross this border on foot, being protested by the Polish authorities. There's a makeshift tent city set up here with food and supplies. And then, of course, they have to move on to the next destination. Many don't know where that will be. And, of course, that uncertainty certainty about their future continues. I spoke to one mother with her two teenage children. She's hoped to, hoping to make it over uh, to Germany. And of course, a deep sadness here amongst uh, the population, the refugees. And of course, the continued fighting in and around the capital, Kyiv. And one uh, couple that I met had just fled from there. It took them two days uh, to leave Kyiv, the capital. That continues. And we've, of course, seen the reports of that bombing of a maternity hospital in Maripol, the port city. And as long as that continues, these refugee flows will continue. People will continue to flee across this border. This just one crossing amongst many, of course, along the Polish-Ukrainian border, not to mention Hungary, Romania as well. So the pressure there on these nations, they continue to accept the refugees and the very real human stories that continue to unfold here on the ground. All right, Tom, thanks very much for that. Bloomberg Tom McKenzie reporting from the Poland-Ukraine border. Now, it's a big day for the economy here as well as in Europe. We're going to get the ECB decision at 7.45 a.m. New York time. That is followed by U.S. CPI data, inflation data at 8.30 a.m. New York time. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Guy Johnson, who is in Frankfurt. We also have Michael McKee standing by on set here in New York. But, Guy, we'll start with you. The ECB is set to decide how it can shield the continent's economy from the consequences of war in Ukraine. A very difficult line for Christine Lagarde to walk. What can we expect? I think what we can expect, Matt, is updated star projections that are basically going to show that we here in the Eurozone are facing a growth hit and we have an inflation hit as well. The ECB is ready to deal with the latter. It really can't deal with the former, to be brutally honest. Uh, I would draw your eyes towards where Maria is and the Leaders' Summit uh, for a solution there. Look at what has just come out of Congress. Look at what has just come out of Washington uh, in terms of the spending bills there. This is a fiscal problem, not a monetary problem on the growth side. The ECB, all it can do is provide plenty of liquidity, uh, and that is already there. Uh, all it can do is make sure that the financial markets and the transmission mechanism, i.e. the the banks are in a stable condition. All of that is in place right now. So the ECB, to be honest, can just park that. There's nothing it can do about it. However, it does have an inflation problem, and the star projections today are going to make that very clear. I think what we're going to see, Matt, is basically the ECB punting this story down the road. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't have the necessary information to make accurate decisions on what is going to happen here. We mm. don't ultimately know what's going to happen in the Ukraine conflict. We don't ultimately know if there's going to problem, be a problem with significant um, uh, energy issues down the road, i.e. gas gets cut off. So it just waits and it watches. But Bloomberg's been talking to the bulk of the governing council over the last few weeks. We are still on track to remove stimulus. That will probably happen now next year, not this year. Yeah. The exit from extraordinary stimulus is simply going to be delayed, Kaylee, and that is ultimately what we're going to get from Christine Lagarde a little bit later on. All right, well, looking for your coverage throughout the day, Guy. Thank you so much to Guy Johnson, who is outside the ECB in Frankfurt. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., CPI is forecast to accelerate to 7.9% in February from a year ago. Let's get to Michael McKee, Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent, for more. Mike, is an eight handle out of the question today? Not out of the question. It's uh, just a rounding uh, exercise for uh, CPI. But, I mean, you're right. We have some really, really ugly numbers here. You've heard it before. 1982, the last time we were seeing numbers like this, and we could go over 8%. Uh, 
gasoline prices rising and uh, also lots of other commodities. The problem is that's happened in March. This is February, so it could get worse. Fed thought it was going to start getting better, but it could get worse. Uh, one interesting thing to watch today is the core rate on a month-over-month -month basis. If that starts to fall, that's good news because some of the uh, core, uh, some of the uh, commodities are not going into the overall number. But two things about the CPI number. One, bad news, economists are generally correct in forecasting. They're pretty close in forecasting. And two, it is last month. So what the Fed is going to be doing is looking at where we go from here. And the problem that we have is we don't know the uncertainty, but we do have a lot of information about what the markets and people mm. think. And right now, it looks like we're seeing uh, a little bit of the market starting to price in inflation going up in its futures contracts. And that is bad news for the Fed. They don't want inflation to become unanchored. So today's uh, hint is watch how the market's inflation expectations react okay. to CPI. Mike, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Mike McKee with a preview of what to expect in that inflation print. Let's turn to some corporate news and take a look at two banks assessing their future with Russia, Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank. Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us now with more. Danny. Anna, we keep hearing more details from banks on what their exposure looks like. Most of these banks are trying to emphasize that their exposure is small and insignificant, but it's the second order effects that we're starting to hear about that has investors concerned. Deutsche Bank, for example, says that their big exposure in IT center in Russia, they're shutting that down, but they did emphasize they have IT elsewhere. But they're saying, look, there are threats now over cybersecurity and sanctions that might have second order impacts to us. Credit Suisse, $900 million is around their exposure exposure to Russia directly. But the concern they have is that, yes, they might bring in better earnings thanks to a volatile market, more derivatives trading, but they're talking about loan loss reserves again. They're talking about deal flow waning due to the concern, the sentiment around the war. So again, loan loss reserves, we're going to be in that sort of scenario like COVID where we hear about that again. Now, for other financial is institutions, and I'm thinking about funds here, your exposure might be more direct. FT reporting overnight that PIMCO has over a billion dollars on the bet that Russia will not default on its bonds, which clearly is a very difficult bet at this moment. Um, so it's in two places. It's in credit default swaps, which they've sold. That's around $1 billion. Essentially, they're going to have to pay out holders if Russia does default to form of insurance. And then they directly hold Russian debt about one and a half billion dollars. So they're getting hit essentially on both sides of this trade. Um, these numbers are so, so big, I should point out, because PIMCO itself is really large, about two trillion, but but still at stake over two billion dollars here. What about the Amazon story, the big stock split? I mean, there's a lot of corporate news out today that we can't lose sight of. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely good to bring up um, Amazon, a 20 to 1 stock split. And look, if you're a student of the markets, um, any mm -hmm. teacher will tell you that stock splits don't matter. It doesn't change fundamentals. It doesn't change market cap. And yet Amazon pre-market is up 6%. Of course, I'm being a little facetious because we typically do see this. Um, mm -hmm. And Amazon also announcing a $10 billion share buyback as well. But essentially the thinking here is, is that because Amazon has run up so much in price, each individual to share share to buy is prohibitively expensive for a retail investor. Of course, you can buy shares fractionally on a lot of the brokerage sites, but still Amazon announcing this has gotten investors excited. The last time they did this was two and a half years after they IPO'd in the late 90s. So this is a question a lot of analysts had asked Amazon. Finally, they are doing it. Danny, thanks very much. Our thanks to Danny Berger with some of the corporate news flow we need to keep an eye on. Plenty to talk about then when it comes to the ECB and US inflation with Reinhard Kluz, uh, UBS chief European economist. He'll join us shortly. And Ukraine saying that Russia will continue their attack until demands are met. That is some of the messaging coming through from that bilateral meeting that took place in Turkey. We will talk to Professor of East European Politics at the University of Birmingham Center for Russian, European and Eurasian Studies. Plus, don't don't miss Bloomberg's new weekly show, Bloomberg Crypto, hosted by Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. The first show debuts Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time with billionaire crypto investor Mike Novogratz. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. We are looking at incredible volatility in these markets. I mean, the DAX yesterday was up 8%. Today, it's down 2.25%. All of this, of course, driven by commodities. Brent crude touched $139 just a couple of days ago, and then yesterday dropped as low as $105. So this volatility is um, really unprecedented. Bloomberg's, uh, Bloomberg MLive's Eddie Vandervault joins us now to talk about what's driving it and um, what, if we can expect it to, to change, obviously, Eddie, it's the war in Ukraine. Um, how do you see this picture? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. You know what? That, that volatility that we see in, in oil markets is still very much news-driven, right? Fresh headlines pushing prices around. And those, that's, that's, by definition, very hard to predict, which makes these markets incredibly hard to trade. But we're not just seeing it in oil. We're seeing it across the commodity markets. And that just adds to the sense of panic in markets because... If you don't know where it's going to hit next, if, it's, if you don't know if it's going to be wheat, if it's going to be palm oil, if it's going to be gold or if it's going to be oil, then you don't know how to, to hedge and how to, you know, limit your exposure to these risks. And that makes these markets really, really tricky at the moment. And it's, it's diff it, good morning to you, Eddie. It's a morning. difficult job just to keep up with all of the headlines, isn't it? Because there's, there's so much coming. I mean, we've just heard from Ukraine in the last half hour that during that meeting that took place in Turkey, that Russia conveyed that we, it will continue to attack until demands, until its demands are met. And I mentioned this not because of the large market reaction, but because it didn't seem to move things much more negative, as if that right. was maybe what the markets were expecting already, although gold did catch a, sh a small bid. Yeah, you know what? I, I think I think it's really hard to see exactly where it's going to play out. I, I tried to estimate yesterday how much risk has been priced into the gold market, and gold at the moment looks like it's about 10% overvalued versus you know where you would expect it to be based on the dollar and so on. So th that tells us that there's a lot of risk priced into the markets already. But does that mean we can't price more risk? You know, it's 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 a really hard market to price at the moment. So, Eddie, given where pricing is and the difficulty of that, what kind of catalyst could CPI be here in the U.S. today? Well, absolutely. The fact that, you know, we, we're seeing these wild commodity markets, for instance, that feeds across into things like inflation and, you know, just, just wider markets broadly. And... It makes it very hard for the Fed and for the ECB to set policy. I think for, for, for the ECB, uh, which, which we're getting later today, I think they will sit back and, and, and watch a little bit. I don't think they will do anything drastic. I don't think they want to spook the markets anymore. So I think for, for the ECB, at least, it's, it's, it's wait and see at this moment in time. But I think those inflationary pressures, they're going to keep building at the same time just as growth is slowing. So it's a really hard balancing act for these central bankers. All right. Thank you so much to Eddie Vandervault of Bloomberg M Live. Good to have you back. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here is the first word. The Russian army's unexpected struggles in Ukraine are raising questions about just how good it is. Vladimir Putin's troops have been bogged down and have failed to take control of key cities. Reports of poor troop morale and organization echo past weaknesses. Observers also are puzzled as to why Russia hasn't used its air power more. Bloomberg has learned the Biden administration may impose sanctions on Russia's state-owned atomic energy company, Rosatom. Rosatom is a delicate target because the company and its subsidiaries account for about 35% of global uranium enrichment. It has agreements to ship nuclear fuel to countries across Europe. In South Korea, the election of conservative Yoon Suk-yeol as president could mean some big policy shifts. Yoon has called for greater private sector-led growth and a tougher approach toward China and North Korea. But the former top prosecutor faces a national assembly where the progressive Democratic Party holds a supermajority. It has little appetite to help Yoon's domestic agenda. But Anna, of course, while we're watching politics across the world, we are also watching markets and the macroeconomic story. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the inflation data that's due out of the United States a little bit later on today. That's going to be something to watch. Uh, clearly, inflation very much a focus for many reasons. We also need to watch the ECB and how the ECB navigates the inflation threat and the global growth story right now. We will get to that conversation with Reinhard Kluzer from UBS shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know.
The House has approved $13.6 billion in emergency spending for the U.S. response to the war in Ukraine. Lawmakers in both parties expect more will be needed for humanitarian relief and for military aid. Meanwhile, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has been meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart Dmitry Kuleba in Turkey today. Kuleba says no progress has been made. Russia is seeking a surrender, but Ukraine won't surrender. The European Central Bank is set to decide how it can shield the continent's economy from the consequences of the war in Ukraine. At the same time, it has to navigate an unprecedented inflation shock. Policymakers may postpone a timetable to end asset purchases. Meanwhile, today's US CPI will give an idea of just how fast prices, uh, prices are rising stateside. And for the first time in more than two decades, Amazon is planning to split its stock. The e-commerce giant announced a 20-for-1 split and a $10 billion share buyback. That has shares rising in pre-market trading. I'm Anna Edwards in London, Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons in New York. And of course, a lot of the focus here is also on the sanction environment. The UK government sanctioning a number of wealthy uh, Russians, including the owner of Chelsea Football Club, Roman Abramovich, Matt. But what else is in focus for you? And after as we all he did for session? the Premier League, right? Can you believe it? I'm actually looking really at the volatility. I mean, it's just been unbelievable. Yesterday, I was telling my boss, um, wow, you know, the DAX is up 4%. And he said, well, what was it yesterday? He said, oh, well, it was down 4%. It's a similar picture when you look at the S&P. We were down 3% on Monday. We were up 2.5% yesterday. Now futures are down half a percent. It's almost like you can um, guess the next day, depending on what happened um, to the previous, as if it's completely disconnected from the fundamentals, though I'm not saying, of course, that it is. S&P futures right now, let's take a look at the uh, futures picture down about uh, half six tenths of one percent as we speak after maybe a little bit of disappointment that there was no progress made in Turkey, although if you want to be part of the EU, that's not really neutrality, is it? Um, the U.S. 10-year yield down a little bit as investors buy that debt. 193.22, uh, I should say, is still a relatively high level. Crude bouncing back again after the big drop that we had yesterday, after the big gain that we had the day before, but still at a high level, 113.93. So it's ratcheting up um, those levels. And Bitcoin down 6.5% after it was up 10% yesterday, 39,200, so still under the 40,000 level. Kaylee, what are you seeing in terms of the pre-market movers? Well, the big company story today is Amazon, Matt. It announced after the bell yesterday a 20-for-1 stock split. Doesn't change the market cap of the company or really anything about the fundamentals and yet you're seeing the stock moving to the upside by about six percentage points in early hours. Part of that likely has to do with also the plan to buy back up to $10 billion worth of shares and maybe more accessibility on the part of retail investors. You have some other big upside movers on the back of earnings. Those include CrowdStrike, which is the cybersecurity software company, as well as Marketo, which is an online payment system. They're each up in the realm of 12 to 12 and a half percent after beating earnings expectations. But one disappointment when it came to earnings was Asana. That's that collaboration software company. It's forecasting a wider loss than analysts expected. And as a result, that stock is plunging almost 25% before the bell, Anna. Uh, Kaylee, here in Europe, we see European equity markets on the back foot. But to Matt's point earlier, yeah, that's in the context of what we saw yesterday and all the days before. Such volatility day by day by day here for European stocks. Today is a down day, but only by 1%, which by recent standards isn't all that much, especially when some of these markets went up by uh, more than 7% in yesterday's session. The euro in focus as we wait to hear from the ECB a little bit later on today. Euro at 110.34. We had seen the euro weakening, of course, uh, on, the, on the developments around the war in Ukraine. But then the talk of joint debt issuance across the eurozone, that got some uh, momentum back into the euro, currently at 110, as I say. This is the aluminum price as it trades on the LME here in London. And this is interesting. Moving up by 5.4%, the UK has sanctioned Oleg Darapaska, and he has a stake in EN+. Plus. That's an aluminum, aluminum business. We also heard from Rio Tinto, which is trading to the downside. That company severing ties with Russia, saying it won't send alumina to its, uh, its operations, that it op jointly operates over in Ireland. And as a as a result, that's another thing that is pushing aluminum prices a little bit higher in this morning's trade. Carlsberg to the downside by 4.6%. This is the biggest brewing business in Russia. They've had to withdraw their guidance for the company. They just don't have the visibility. A lot of businesses probably face that issue, depending on their, their geographical exposure, of course. But they're also reviewing those operations over in Russia and, uh, and warning the markets what kind of uh, financial impact that might have, Kaylee.
All right, well, let's talk about economic impacts as well. Goldman Sachs expects the euro area economy to shrink and now inflation closer to 8% because of Russia's war in Ukraine. We spoke with the bank's chief European economist earlier. We made a large downgrade to our euro area growth numbers, reflecting tighter financial conditions, weaker trade, but most importantly, big spillovers via the energy market. We've cut uh, the area wide number to two and a half percent. We see the euro area on the edge of recession um, in the first half. Joining us now is Reinhard Close, UBS chief European economist. So Reinhard, Europe is looking at potentially lower growth and higher inflation. What does that mean for Christine Lagarde and the ECB? How hard is their job today? I mean, their job has uh, become a lot harder. They have to balance this difficult uh, situation between much higher inflation on the one hand and the risk of much lower growth on the other hand. We think they will respond uh, to this sort of tension by not doing too much today. Previously, we thought that today the ECB would announce when they uh, will end the APP, the Asset Purchase Program, later in the year. But given all the uncertainty that we now have, we think they will uh, delay this decision to the next meeting on the 14th of April. So not too much um, in terms of hard policy announcement today. There'll be some other decisions um, more on the technical side. I should also say within the grand scheme of things, we do not expect uh, the ECB to turn outright dovish because uh, in light of much higher rates of inflation, which also imply a risk that wage growth will pick up meaningfully, there is still a significant risk of pro-inflationary second round effects in the pipeline. And that means the ECB cannot turn too dovish today. Mm. If we hear, good morning to you, Reinhard. If we hear messages from the ECB that suggest their focus is on inflation and the growth concerns are really a fiscal, more of a fiscal issue and, and it should be fiscal actors who take, uh, who take action there, uh, would, would you agree with that, Reinhard? Is there anything the ECB should or can do about the growth story at this point? The ECB itself cannot do too much. Uh, that is correct. But the growth impact will be meaningful. There will be a hit to uh, fixed investment via weaker corporate confidence. There's going to be a big hit on household consumption. But you're right. Um, policymakers on the fiscal side can do a lot uh, in order to increase the resilience of the private sector, of the household sector, also the corporate sector. So the decisions we might get at the EU level uh, over the next couple of weeks, but also in individual uh, capitals, across the eurozone will be very important and those could make the ecb's job easier yes how convinced are you reinhard by by, by talk of and, and, and our reporting around joint debt issuance by the eurozone and what kind of difference that can make how substantial it would need to be to make a substantial difference i mean we we see some people attributing the rally yesterday in in risk assets globally in part to what we've heard this week on that front so I personally thought this was a bit premature. These will be very, very difficult discussions. We shouldn't expect anything from the informal meeting of EU uh, leaders today in terms of hard, concrete decisions. There's another EU summit later in the month. But I think we should differentiate between uh, common debt issuance on the one hand, where the debt and the liability will still be uh, on the shoulders of individual countries, or debt issuance that involves significant mutualization uh, and risk sharing. And I think the hurdle towards the latter, where there's in fact risk sharing among the EU, is a lot higher. So I think uh, raising debt at the EU level itself um, is not necessarily the full solution. Uh, the you know, much more um, far-reaching step would be to mutualize, but for that the political resistance uh, might also be a bit higher, so it might not happen. Is there any concern that we go back to um, the stagflation of the 1970s, Reinhardt, especially with, um, you know, gas prices are already so high in Europe at the pump, and um, those can only go higher here. Growth seems like it's going to be slowing down, so the prices of, you know, everything you need to live are going to rise dramatically while um, no one's going to get raises anymore. Yeah, thank you. So I would be personally a bit careful to talk about stagflation. What is correct is that the growth inflation balance has clearly worsened. So we have a lot more inflation. We will have less growth. So uh, that is uh, definitely uh, a significant deterioration. But uh, we might not have stagnation um, uh, 
I mean, remember, we came from growth forecast of around 4% or even slightly higher. So we would certainly pay our price. Uh, growth will be weaker, but whether it will mean outright stagnation, um, you know, this will be decided over the next uh, couple of months. For us, what is very crucial is where do oil prices settle? At what level? How long will they be at those levels? And very importantly, will the physical volumes of energy supplies to Europe be cut? Um, I think if physical volumes will not be cut, if we're only, only in inverted commas talking about somewhat higher prices for um, you know, a couple of months, the damage will be you know, still meaningful, but it would not be uh, implying an outright recession. If the physical volumes were to be cut, then we're talking about recession, then we would certainly talk about a, a nasty stagflation a scenario that would also be a massive headache for policymakers. How, how connected are um, the global economies? If we see a recession here in the U.S., Reinhardt, for example, will we see a recession in Europe as well? Yeah, I think that Europe is, of course, much more exposed because we are closer in geographical terms, also because we're so much more dependent on uh, Russian energy. Uh, compared with that, the U.S. is in a much better situation. So I would think that the you know, key fallout will fall upon us here in Europe. Reinhard, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Reinhard Kluzer joining us there from UBS. Coming up on this program, we'll discuss the latest negotiations in, Ukra in the Ukraine war with Katerina Volchuk, Professor of East European Politics at the University of Birmingham's Centre for Russian, European and Eurasian Studies. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Deutsche Bank CFO James von Molka. This is Bloomberg. We also raised the issue of a ceasefire, 24 hour ceasefire, to resolve the most pressing humanitarian issues. We did not make progress on this since uh, it seems that there are other decision makers uh, for, this, uh, for this matter in Russia. We agreed to continue uh, efforts to uh, seek a solution. That was Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba speaking earlier at a meeting in Turkey where he'd been uh, talking to the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Joining us now to give us her perspective on what is developing the war in Ukraine, Katerina Volchuk, uh, Associate Fellow of the Russia and Eurasian Programme at Chatham House. Katerina, thank you so much for joining us. So we heard there from the Ukrainian Foreign Minister, no ceasefire agreed. Uh, he, he also said that Russia has communicated it will continue its attack until its demands are met. Do you see any room for compromise, any room that, any, any, any diplomatic solution to what we are seeing at the moment in Ukraine? No, at the moment, any diplomatic solution is far off. And we know that um, Foreign Minister um, Lavrov is not, doesn't belong to the inner circle of Putin's associates. He's just a sort of postman, post delivery boy. He delivers the message from the Kremlin to the Ukrainians. So he was not the person who can actually negotiate. As, and as Minister Kuleba pointed out, he's not the one who can actually engage in meaningful negotiations. And from that point of view, the position of the Kremlin has not changed. They, they may have softened the language, but the ultimatum to Ukraine remains the same. Katerina, is it possible, even from a Western um, point of view, uh, to consider Ukraine neutral if they also join the European Union? Exactly. This is the question. And we know from uh, negotiations with Russia that we may think we're talking about the same thing, like diplomacy, neutrality, and yet they have different meanings. And that's exactly what happened with what we know called the Minsk agreements, which were supposed to solve the crisis, but they were imbued with such different meanings 
there was actually not possible to find a, co a compromise. And I feel that this sort of softening of line from the Kremlin is uh, made to, for Ukraine to digest, to absorb the, the ultimatum a bit easier, but ultimately the conditions are not changed. We're, we're looking at pictures here of, I believe, what is allegedly, uh, what was allegedly a maternity ward or a children's hospital. The Russians claim, of course, that uh, Ukrainian soldiers were, were using that as cover. Um, when we, uh, uh, when, when we look at the damage done, it's not nearly as bad as it could be, Katerina. And many Western observers are asking the question, why isn't Russia using more of its air force? Um, do you have an answer for that? It's really difficult to tell because we know that the Russian military has underperformed. Billions of dollars have been spent on modernizing the Russian armed forces. And there have been images of Russian soldiers catching chickens, um, chicken in Ukraine presumably, you know, you don't get them as pets, probably you want to eat them. So this has get, give, gives us an impression in what situation that some parts of the Russian military are. Why they are not using more air force is puzzling. There are explanations about different sort of altitude and uh, weapons from the West making a difference. And um, so the Russian military is not in a good shape and it's probably still um, not going to the stage of escalation where we would be sort of in doing indiscriminate carpet bombing. So okay. from that view, they're still keeping some sort of things, um, you know, the more escalation is possible. So, Katerina, if the military is not in great shape, what about the broader domestic population in Russia? Clearly, that economy is being crippled by sanctions, yet we read so many reports about misinformation that the Russian population may not actually know what to believe. Is Putin facing pressure domestically? Yes and no. We know that the Russian state, the economy is taking a massive hit, much greater than what we are seeing in the West. But it doesn't mean that the population is going to rebel, first of all, because they may not know, they may not care, and ultimately, they're not able to do much about this. Even if, if you realize what's going on in Ukraine, how you're going to uh, basically um, influence the Kremlin. So the regime, the political regime in Russia is quite resilient. It is uses outright coercion uh, at the moment to suppress any dissident, uh, dissent, and the Russian media are full, uh, basically, of full of stories that the West is having second thoughts and it's going to to surrender, basically, to soften its line on Russia, and it, you know, quite quite soon. So from that point of view. We, I don't think it would be realistic to expect the population in Russia to rebel, but uh, the key part to watch is the Kremlin, and it's mm. the most difficult part because if there are changes, if there is dissent, if there is going to be some kind of palace coup, we are not going to know it until it happens. Katerina, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Katerina Volchuk, uh, Chatham House, uh, joining us there. Coming up next hour, Maria Tadeo will be speaking to the Estonian Prime Minister, uh, one of the Baltic countries, of course, with a lot to say on the subject of war in Ukraine and where Russia's ambitions lie. That's coming up at 6.10 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lyons with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Also joining us now, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom, you're in for a big couple hours. The ECB less than two hours away. CPI shortly thereafter. Where's your focus this morning? Well, that's a regular news, but there's been such a deterioration in what we've seen in Ukraine on so many mm -hmm. different fronts, including what's going on in Turkey. Maybe it's a time to put it in perspective. Not 8, 9, even 10 percent inflation is modeled by Bloomberg Economics. Let's put in perspective commodities. And Kaylee, I take real issue with OMG, commodities are terrible. This is inflation adjusted Bloomberg Commodity Index. It's really good mathematics. You can see the great commodity deflation that we've seen over 20, 30, 40 years. And we are nowhere near the commodity crisis of the 1970s. We are distant from that agony.
so few. It's not the 70s. You've brought us the best news all hour, <coughs> Tom. Uh, and th this does tie into the obsession of the moment, though, about whether we are talking really about some kind of stagflationary environment. We talked to a, a, a guest earlier on who was saying, yes, we seriously have inflation, but stagflation, we have... We, we've got <coughs> economies that are actually bouncing still we from their pandemic lows. So it's difficult... Yeah, exactly. The stagnation part is missing. The, the, the part that's there and the mystery is economic growth. And Anna, it's truly going to be, it's a really uncertain time. I, I'm really glad I'm not making quarterly analysis of what GDP is going to do. And the answer is nobody has a clue. And my guess is some will do well and many others won't. And the same goes, for example, on the commodity chart, food. Is, you know, is, is someone said, I, I, my brain freezes right now. Um, somebody said a loaf of bread, Carl Weinberg of High Frequency Economics said a loaf of bread in America is seven cents wheat. Seven cents mm. is the wheat cost. All the rest is shipping and packaging and, and, and the rest. Is food inflation in America a big deal on a relative basis? No. Don't say that to people in Cairo this morning. Mm. Tom, thank you very much. Tom sure. Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Thanks to Tom for joining us. Uh, and uh, uh, just a quick mention of some of the breaking news lines. There's been so much, Kaylee and Matt, hard to keep up in the last hour and a half. Of course, the news lines coming out of Turkey, that very important meeting between Ukraine and mm. Russia taking place there. But also on the UK front, UK sanctioning Roman Abramovich, Oleg Deripaska and others on, on Russia's war in Ukraine. And crucially, the connections that these, uh, that these, uh, that these men and these businessmen have to the Kremlin. Uh, and this could go far. This could have far-reaching implications, in particular for Chelsea Football Club, and it sounds niche, but this takes us into new territory, perhaps, in, in terms of how the sanctions story plays out here, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how sanctions start to punish those who uh, apply them, right? Because mm. um, you'll be so unhappy to see Chelsea uh, have a poor record going forward. In all seriousness, um, I have to wonder how much the inflation is going to hurt Europe if they really do try and reduce their dependence on Russia, it seems almost an impossibility um, for Germany. And maybe um, the Europeans just don't have the strength of spine that the Russians do. I guess that's what it's all going to come down to. Uh, we'll certainly be focused on the uh, economics as we go through the day. Then Matt and Kaylee, of course, the uh, CPI number out the US, the ECB meeting. More Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.